Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we are to be called children of God because thanks to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is what we are. Dear friends in Jesus, the gospel that will serve for our sermon today comes from Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 and following. I'd invite you to rise out of respect for the gospel. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Dear friends in our resurrected Lord Jesus, yard work is frustrating. How many of you think you have thought it or said it out loud once before? Yeah, I know I, I have too. And it's not exactly a surprising thing to come through your mind because yard work is hard work. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes a little know-how with the garden and with the yard. And we put so much time and effort into our yard because we care how our house looks, and that includes the exterior of the house generally, too. But what can often happen is, like we saw yesterday, the weather will change. We're often at the mercy of the seasons. For example, you could be in one week of fall and be raking leaves. And the very next week, and especially in Wisconsin, you could be shoveling snow and you could be scraping ice off your car, and you could be putting salt on the sidewalk. And then the very next week, you could very well be cutting the grass, or pulling weeds, or watering flowers. It seems like there's always something outside that needs to be done. It seems like this is a never-ending list of stuff we have to do. Now occasionally, our life as a Christian can sometimes feel this way. It seems like we have this never-ending list of things we have to do. And we try to do our best. We go to church. We memorize the Ten Commandments in catechism class. We participate in Bible class. But oftentimes, doesn't it feel like we fail? Oftentimes, doesn't it feel like we have fallen short? Well, the people of Jesus' day, they had a similar problem. They were being spiritually bombarded by their church leaders, being told, you have to obey God to the best of your abilities, but they didn't offer the people any relief. They were putting all this on the backs of the people. They were demanding perfection. Jesus, he felt his people's pain, and he addresses them in the gospel for today. In it, we hear of Jesus' invitation to come to him. Because through Jesus, we can truly know who God the Father is. And through Jesus, we find rest for our souls. Now the church leaders of Jesus' day, especially a group called the Pharisees, were notorious for laying down all these kinds of rules and regulations that uh, supposedly came down from Moses. But they didn't just do that. They also demanded that they perform ceremonies perfectly, that they recite the Torah perfectly, that they had all this in their back pocket. And you wouldn't be a good Jew if you weren't. Now, many times during his ministry, Jesus had to publicly call them out for this, this outrage that they were placing on the backs of the people. They had given the people a very heavy heart. 
Well, in the story, we hear of this time when Jesus, it seems like he just stops in the middle of all he's doing, and he prays out loud about a specific kind of people. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned. Who do you think the wise and the learned are that Jesus just mentioned? Well, if the Pharisees are standing nearby, they could probably take the hint. After all, they were the smartest men in Israel. They knew what Moses had said. They knew what the law indicated. The sad part is, as much time as they spent studying God's Word and what God's Word said, they used it as an advantage to wield authority and power over their people, to make them feel superior before God. And Jesus, he knew what they were thinking. He knew that they thought that they were going to please God with their actions, that if they acted better, if they worked harder than the rest of the people, they could earn their place in heaven by God's side. The sad part is, these men were no better than anybody else. The sad part is, they were still sinful in God's eyes. So no matter how hard they worked, no matter how well they knew the law, they would still be sinful before the judge. And if the Pharisees are listening to this, you can almost see the cringe on their face, kind of the disgusting look. Jesus has the gall to say this to them, and then he continues by saying, God revealed these things to little children? They probably jumped out of their shoes at something like that. But Jesus' point in saying something like that is not that they literally had to be children, but that they needed to have the faith of a little child. Because by themselves, by their works, they were not going to be able to earn heaven. And this message, it's pretty comforting for those listening to Jesus, of people feeling the pressure of trying to be perfect. God revealed himself and his love to those who hear his word and believe it with a very simple, childlike faith. And we know this is true because of what Jesus says immediately after. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. This wonderful statement, this truth, completely tore down what the Pharisees and the other leaders were trying to put on the backs of the people. It redirected the people back to what really mattered. And at that point, Jesus turned to his followers and he continues to talk about this relationship with God. He says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. Throughout his ministry, Jesus time and again had tried to explain to the people this unique relationship he had with God the Father. The Father and the Son, they share knowledge. They know what the other person knows. And only the Father knows what Jesus wants, and he reveals that to us in his words in the Bible. He reveals to us that Jesus was willing and desired to die on behalf of all the people of all time. And what does the Son reveal to us about the Father? He reveals to us that God is love. He's not just this vengeful judge. He's also the Father in heaven. He wants the people to know that God has a plan to save them. The amazing part is that believers, too, can know this truth because he shared it with those who trust in him with that simple childlike faith. As he says at the end of verse 27, those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus' ultimate lesson is very simple. Trust in him. Not in those other experts who claim to know what the Bible says. They may know what it says, what the words are, They did not know who God really was. There is only one way to know God and his love for humanity, and that is by faith. Faith in his promises and faith in his Son. And That is why Jesus invites us to come to him. Fellow Christians, the best people of the world will try to tell you that the way to God is 
to work your hardest, try your best, do a little bit more. But this motive, which might have all the good intentions involved, is infected with sin. There's nothing we can do on our own. And if you take a look at any other religions in the world, you'll see that this idea that you have to work your way to heaven is a pretty prevalent, a pretty constant theme that arises. And it's sad to say that even parts of Christianity have fallen prey to this sad teaching that it's all on your shoulders. It's a common false teaching that goes all the way back to when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And the truth is, our efforts don't change anything before God. And sometimes we can get into that same mentality. We try to tell ourselves that if I try hard enough to obey God and his commands, maybe he'll take notice. He'll give me a little bit more of heaven. But friends, it's just as impossible for us as it is for anyone else. And uh, we learn in catechism class, in confirmation class, what Luther explains to us in the third article of the small catechism. I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. God wants us to rely on him with a simple childlike faith. Think about that trust a little baby has in its mother. There's a certain want, a need, a dependence. They need the mother to survive. That's the kind of faith, the reliance God wants you to have on him. Total reliance. And Jesus tells us how we can know God that way. By faith. Faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. This faith, this faith is the ticket that we need to know God. It is the ticket that gives us the faith, or he gives us this ticket of faith through the power of the gospel and in the word and in the sacraments that we will receive in a little bit here. But it seems as if we try our hardest and there's a certain fluidity, a certain changingness that continuously happens to us as we go through our Christian lives. Like the weather, our relationship with God can change based on how much we interact with the Word, with the Word of God, how much we listen to it, how much we listen to other people, and sometimes just kind of the day we're having. Let me ask it this way. How many of you are fairly confident with your position before God today, that you stand in good standing? What about tomorrow? Like the weather, we can guess what the next day will be like for us spiritually. But like so many weathermen, what if we get it wrong? Some days, we can feel pretty similar to doubting Thomas in that upper room. Doubting what God is even capable of for us. Other days, it feels like the law is only functioning. The Bible is only functioning in one way, and that is a mirror showing us that we are so sinful and that we are worthless in God's eyes. This is what it was like for the people of Jesus' day. And Jesus addresses this constant pressure of the law being put on them as a yoke. And a yoke is an older word that we don't really use anymore. It's not really an egg yoke, but it's more of something that you would tie two oxen together or two cattle that would, you'd attach a plow to and they would drive it through the field. So it made farming easier, it made it more efficient, and it, uh, it would generally be put on the back of the heaviest animals. This was a heavy piece of machinery you got going on here. Jesus knew this impossible task that they were being, that the people were having put on their backs. He knew that this yoke of the law was a heavy burden on the people of Israel. So Jesus, he redirects the focus. He addresses this by focusing, putting, pushing the people back to what really mattered. That's God's love. And what does God want the people to do? He wants them to look to Jesus. Why? Well, we hear why in that next verse when we hear that wonderful invitation from Jesus when he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Jesus had this ability to remove the burden of the law from the backs of the people. He carried his own yoke, thereby making it easy for him to carry our yoke too. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus came to earth to keep the law perfectly for them, and that's exactly what he did. And then he carried another burden, a burden that was the heaviest one of all. He carried on his back the sins of every single person who ever lived. And with those sins pressing down on his shoulders, he walked all the way to the cross, he lived that perfect life, and he died for us. Because he carried this yoke, he lifted that burden of the law from the back of the people. He made it possible by living that perfect life and dying that perfect death. And the prophet Isaiah foretold this long ago in the Old Testament when he said, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because he loves the world, Jesus carried this burden willingly. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. He never put his own needs first. He could have. He had every chance in the world to walk away from the cross, to not die that death that we deserved. But he didn't walk away. He did it all for us. And Isaiah again foretold this long before Jesus even walked on earth when he said, He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Because of what Jesus did, there's no longer a need to feel like we are living under this burden of the law, like this burden under, under this burden that we have to be perfect before God's eyes. He has set humanity free. By putting our faith in Jesus as our substitute, we find rest. And it can be hard for us, though, I think in our well circles, to understand what life would be like for someone who's constantly trying to earn their place before God or work their way to heaven. But maybe some of you today know what that's like before you came to know what the Bible truly says. But we do all have those days, those days when we feel the pressure of trying to be perfect. We try hard and we fall short. Has there ever been a time in your life when you sinned or you fell into a mistake? You just keep making the same one over and over and you think, how could God forgive someone like me? That's exactly what the devil wants you to think. He wants you to think, that there is no rest for your weary soul. But Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He wants you to look to him for, his, for your spiritual comfort because in him you will find that gentle invitation to calm your soul. You will find forgiveness and rest. He puts us at ease and brings us peace of mind, kind of like a baby being sung to sleep or a little kid being told a story right before the bedtime for them. It seems to calm them down, doesn't it? It soothes them. It brings them rest. But don't be mistaken, we will face troubles while we're here on earth. Satan keeps waking us up and robbing us of that rest that we so desperately need. But that will all end on that last day, when we rest in heaven forever, when we get to reside in the arms of our Savior through eternity. Think of those disciples in that upper room with Thomas. They had wonder and even doubt in their hearts. Jesus' words on that Sunday of Easter, they give that same message of rest, that same message of tranquility and peace that he has for them when he says, peace be with you. 
You know, the seasons are changing. As we saw yesterday, it seems like they're kind of in a fluctuation right now. But the amount of work we do outside will eventually change. We'll have to go out and mow the lawn eventually. But when we look to Jesus, that list of yard work that we have to do spiritually, the one that always feels like it's never getting done, like we're always following short of, it's already been done. The grass has been cut. The plants have been uh, cut down or have been shaved. The flowers have been watered. The weeds have been pulled. It's all been done for you. You can relax because with faith in Jesus, you will always find that invitation to come to him and rest. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times. Like us on Facebook or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.